Good morning, I'm Bill Herman. Uh, the scripture reading today is from Acts 2, 37 to 47. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what, sh what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed him, his message were baptized, and, no, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. My name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street United Methodist Church. And today we continue in our worship series called Lifelong Learners. A couple of weeks ago, we reaffirmed our baptismal vows, recommitted our lives to Jesus Christ in that section we call invite and learn that our task is also to invite others just as somebody invited us on this journey. Today we will be talking about the step we call inquire. Let us pray together. Holy God, get me out of the way this morning and speak the word of Jesus Christ to each of our hearts, each in the way that we need to hear. In the name of Jesus Christ, the divine word, amen. I suppose that my work gives me a kind of a different perspective at some types of ordinary gatherings for people because people will ask me questions or make comments that nobody else gets to hear. Sometimes when I'm at the funeral home, I will be, you know, engaged in conversation, finding out about family and meeting people, and somebody will pull me aside and just quietly say, Pastor, I just want you to know that the deceased was a believer. And I hear some, some mild chuckles because you understand this in, person is in a very raw place and this is not the place to have the conversation, but what's going on underneath are a couple of I would call them questionable understandings. First, the questionable understanding is that somehow each of us, especially the pastor, can determine whether or not somebody is going to go to heaven or not. Because, you know, every Sunday we just about stand up here and we recite the Apostles' Creed and we say, Jesus Christ will judge the living and the dead, not Kirk or anybody else. And the second misunderstanding is that, well, if we've just professed our faith, if we're a believer, then that means we're in, that we don't really have to do anything, regardless of whether or not the individual was a part of a community of faith or served the community in Jesus' name, you know, the person was a believer, so you can rest at ease. Some of us learned the little song about Jesus and the house on the rock. So from our the time we were children, we learned this lesson from Jesus in Matthew chapter 7. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise person who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish person who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Do you hear the distinction Jesus makes between a faith that is solidly grounded on rock that no storm in your life can shake versus a faith that's built on sand? 
He said, either you acted on my words or you didn't. That's the distinction. It's not rocket science. Did you do your best to actually live out what you learned? Saying we believe in Jesus Christ, and like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, when we are invited and we become initiated into the community of faith, baptism and our profession of faith, that's the starting point. It's not the end. It's not like we can say, I profess my faith in Jesus Christ, and now I can play, on my, play solitaire on my smart, smartphone for the rest of my life, you know? Christ demands, our faith compels that we act on it, that we do something. Every now and then I'm gathered, you know, and, and, and meeting new people, and, you know, who are you, and what do you do for a living? And somebody will say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a physician. Oh, wow. How long have you been practicing? 25 years. And the little devil inside me goes, 25 years you've been practicing? When do you actually get to do it? <laughs> you know, at some point, we learn and we learn and we learn, and then we have to actually get to put into practice what we've learned. We all need someone to keep us going in faith. If baptism, our initiation, our profession of faith is the beginning, we need, we need something, we need someone to help keep us going in the Christian faith. As we said, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about invite, and uh, here's what we said about it. We invite others to be a part of our worship, our small groups, and our service because it reflects how Christ invites us to be in a loving relationship with God and with our neighbors. And when we had that baptismal reaffirmation service, we took water and we made a sign of a cross on your forehead, and we said these words, remember your baptism and be thankful the Holy Spirit work within you that you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, it's the starting point. But the Holy Spirit continues with us throughout our entire lives so that we can be faithful disciples. We need, and the easy way to keep us going is that we need somebody alongside of us. This is what the early church did. Did you notice the lesson from the book of Acts this morning? And, and let me put this in context. Remember, this is Acts chapter 2. It's the day of Pentecost, what we call the birthday of the church, when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon Peter and the rest of the apostles, and some kind of miracle that's so hard to explain takes place. People from all over the world have gathered in Jerusalem, speaking all kinds of different languages, and somehow, some way, when the Spirit is poured out, they can talk to one another. They can communicate. And Peter stands up to deliver that first awkward sermon, saying, Hey, folks, these people aren't drunk. Some of you have read this text. And then he goes out and he lays out the very simple gospel of Jesus. God made flesh, who came into the world, who died for our sake to cover our sin and was risen from the dead. Then we get to the part we heard this morning. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the others, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said, Repent and be baptized. Back to that invite piece. And then they go on, and it says those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. They didn't just stop with being baptized. They gathered together. They listened to the teaching so they could grow in their faith, so that one day they could live out their faith. And of course, they got together, and they broke the bread, and they prayed together. I also want you to pay attention to the last phrase. It says, the Lord added to, the, to their number those who were being saved. Notice, salvation is not a one-time event in our past. They are being saved. We continually grow closer and closer to God, more and more in love with Jesus Christ. We grow in our faith. Last year, uh, all of the Methodist preachers and representatives from every congregation gathered together in the summer in this thing we call annual conference, and our bishop, Sharma Lewis, preached. She had been listening to all the Methodists throughout Virginia for a year before she developed a vision statement, and I wanted to share that vision statement with you this morning. Our ministry vision for the Virginia Annual Conference is to be disciples of Jesus Christ who are lifelong learners, who influence others to serve. You see, she emphasizes this process of learning how to be a disciple and having people alongside of us as we grow in our faith for our entire lives. You're never done. God is never finished with you, right? 
we just continue to learn. You'll also, those of you who know our church's vision statement, notice the parallels. That we're followers of Jesus, right? Disciples, that's the word. And then we talk about we love God in worship, we love others in small groups, and then we serve the world in Christ's name and mission. Notice the parallels, how similar this is. This is the job that, that we're trying to do as a church. Worship and small groups and service are the pieces that our congregation, Braddock Street Church, offers to you so that you can grow in your faith. So today we talk about inquire, our small group piece of this lifelong learning process. We create spaces to inquire about our faith in small groups because the conversation that follows encourages us to grow in our faith and in our relationship with others. We grow closer to God and we grow closer to others. This is how the early church started in the book of Acts. And for those of us who are Methodist, this is where Methodism started. There was never originally any intention to found a new denomination. John Wesley, on the day he died, was still a priest of the Church of England. What he tried to start was a group of accountability groups called societies, bands, classes, small groups within the Church of England so that Christians could hold one another accountable on their walk with Jesus Christ. I wanted to give you a flavor of what that was like. So here are Wesley's rules for bands and societies. This is back in 1738. Those of you who know your Methodist history know we didn't come together as a denomination until 1784. So 40-some years, it was just a small group movement and nothing else. Here are the rules. Number one, to meet once a week at the least. Number two, to come punctually at the hour appointed without some extraordinary reason, right? You, you're starting to get a flavor of the early Methodists. Better bring a doctor's note if you're late. Uh, number three, to begin, those of us who are present, exactly at the hour with singing or prayer. Number four, to speak, each of us in order, freely and plainly, the true state of our souls, with the faults we have committed in thought, word, or deed, and the temptations we have felt since our last meeting. Number five, to end every meeting with prayer suited to the state of each person present. And finally, number six, to desire some person among us to speak his own state first and then to ask the rest in order as many and as searching questions as may be concerning their state, sins, and temptations. Ain't that a party, right? <laughs> I mean, for those of you that have never been a part of a small group, that's not how we do it, okay? Certainly not in the first week. But you see how serious this, how serious they took this. And this was where the Holy Spirit worked among the early Methodists. John Wesley would preach in the open air, in the streets, and in the fields, and thousands of people would commit or recommit their life to Jesus Christ. And of course, Wesley just went on to the next town next. But before he left, at the end of each one of these sermons that he gave, and this is all a part of the great awakening of Christianity in Western Europe, at the end of his message, he would tell them where the Methodist society was meeting and encourage all of them to be there because we can all have a powerful emotional experience of God, but if we don't follow up, right? Some of us remember the Billy Graham crusades. They used to go into a town and they would find out who the, where the churches were and they would always try and connect people with the local congregations long after Billy Graham was gone. We need that ongoing group of people to help us. So our current small groups, we don't start by confessing all of our sins. Um, but hopefully over time, if you meet with a group of people, over the years you build a safe space where you get to share what's really going on in your life. And I don't mean the, the profile that you put on Facebook, right, where all, only the good stuff shows. But what's really going on? Where you're struggling as perhaps a married couple or with your parents or struggling with your, boor, your, your boss, or maybe you lost your job, or maybe you're hearing a call to ordain ministry and you need some good friends to, to talk about that. What does that look like? We need what we call simply a small group. So I wanted to offer, you know, when we use that phrase, what are we talking about? Here's the definition. A group of 12 to 15 people. Jesus started with 12. It, those of us who've been in small groups, you know, that's kind of the best size right in there. 12 to 15 people within the Braddock Street community that gathers together to study scripture, fellowship, pray, and sometimes even eat together. It cracks me up that as you read the book of Acts, it was the breaking of bread and the prayers. Even though nowhere else in scripture or in the United Methodist Book of Discipline does it say you have to have a covered dish to get into heaven. 
you know, sometimes when we get together, you think that. There's something about food that allows us to share in a more informal way. It just makes it more real and authentic. So that's what a small group is. If you've ever thought about being a small group leader, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the teacher and the biblical expert. A small group leader is a person with some form of leadership role within a small group. They can host the group, you know, prepare the coffee in a Sunday school class, or host the group in your home. Um, They could facilitate the discussion, or they could coordinate the meetings, or provide the food, or whatever that may be. We need all of these people to be a part of our small group leadership. And then sometimes we use the word Sunday school. You know, we used to always talk about Sunday school. Why are we talking about small groups all of a sudden? Well, Sunday school is a type of small group that just happens to meet on Sunday morning. I won't even bother to read the rest of that, but that's what it's about. And we need those kinds of groups so that we can continue to grow. The kinds of people that will will listen when you're doubting your faith, where you've got questions like, Why is it that God allowed my child to die? You understand that as I stand here in a pulpit on Sunday morning, there is no way I can know what's going on in the personal lives of all of our 1,100 members. And certainly I couldn't squeeze, you know, all that into 15 or 20 minutes on a Sunday morning. The truth is I just don't know. And it's not the kind of thing that we can all stand up every Sunday morning and share, you know, that I'm struggling with, with whatever in our lives. We need that group of folks. So that's why we're continually asking you to be engaged in the small group. So we want you to be plugged in somewhere. And so we have all kinds of different types of groups. First, we have the one-time meeting. The most obvious for us is what we call the connection, where new people come and we have just a one-time event where folks can ask questions about Braddock Street Church, Christian belief, Methodist belief, and we share our our faith stories there. Next, we have the short-term study, four to six weeks. Sometimes that's what we're dealing with in worship. Sometimes it's a topic. Sometimes it's a book of the Bible. Sometimes it's a question like, well, what theologians call theodicy. Why do good people suffer? We need a place to go back and forth with that. There are the ongoing regular small groups, our Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday school small groups, our United Methodist men, our United Methodist women, blast. That's for our youth. We call it the big, loud, awesome spirit thing, right? And so you also know our youth Many of them also meet on Wednesday mornings at Chick-fil-A before school for devotion together. You could not have gotten me up when I was in high school for anything before school. But it means so much to them. And for those who are mature in their faith and they're really ready to dig into Scripture, there are those long-term studies that go deep. And one that I'm particularly thinking about is the Disciple Bible Study series. I will tell you as somebody, the first time I took just Disciple 1, I learned more about the Bible than I learned in any seminary course. It's like college level at least, study of the scriptures. By the time you're done, after 34 weeks, you will have read 80% of the scriptures. You will have looked at each book in its context. You know, who was the author? Who were they talking to? What do you think God was saying then so that we can understand what God is saying to us now? Why is it that, you know, you get to ask those questions. Why is it that there's this part about God telling the people of Israel to kill women and children in the Old Testament? And and yet Jesus is so different. When you study the entire scriptures, you get to fill in some of the holes. You're left with some tough questions still. And this may not be for somebody that's a new Christian. So we offer all these different types of small groups, study groups, because we want you to plug in somewhere. And so I wanted to pause for just a minute and say thank you to all of you who are members, longtime members of Braddock Street Church, because we just went into a new Sunday morning worship schedule. For those of you that are new, we just started on January the 7th with a new schedule. We ask everybody to worship 15 minutes later, and we ask parents to bring your children and your youth early if, if you want to come to the contemporary service, but spend two hours with us so that everybody can worship and be a part of a small group on Sunday morning. And I just wanted to say thank you because I know change and the discussion leading up to change is not easy. But I wanted to tell you we're already seeing the benefit. We're already seeing an increase in our worship attendance, primarily coming from our children and youth that are actually worshiping God. And we're seeing a whale of a lot of increase in our small group participation. For about four or five years that I'm aware of, we We averaged 150 to 165 people on Sunday morning 
uh, gathering together in small groups. So far in January, it's more like 240 or 250. So thank you for engaging one another and engaging the scriptures in that way. It's a powerful movement, and this congregation will see the benefits for many, many years to come as we all take our faith more seriously. Because here's the bottom line. The difference that a small group makes to your life. It shapes you. It molds you. It lets you go into the dark places that maybe you never even thought about going before. And you get to listen to others. I wanted to share with you what some of our own church members have said about the difference small groups have made in their life. One person said, without small groups, my faith would likely have stagnated. The Bible teaches us that we're supposed to gather with other Christians to learn and to grow. In fact, the Bible can be hard to understand without a group. Every time you read the same passage, you see and you learn new things. The human interaction with the scriptures, the discussion, and the accountability are probably the most helpful things. Being involved in a small group is the best way to grow in your faith. Another person said, small groups have been my lifeline over the years as an adult. They cheered my successes. They cried with me during unimaginable loss. They were my link to Jesus when I had nothing else at the time. It isn't about the book you're reading in the long run. It's about the relationships you build. Another person said, in terms of the community, small groups have kept me involved in the church community. It's easy to slip in and out of church. It's a bit more difficult to slip in and out of small groups. They helped us plug in, and they have kept us plugged into Braddock Street United Methodist Church. And in terms of the education, discussion in small groups have made me a more curious Christian. I love that phrase. And that curiosity has turned into research. And that research has turned into the quest for knowledge, both from the Bible and from those who have provided commentary on biblical teachings. Small group discussion really has been one of the most powerful forces in my Christian life. If you're not engaged in a small group, I want you to fully appreciate what you're missing this morning. And I remember a backyard conversation I had with my backdoor neighbor years ago when I served a, a small country church, and he was a strong member of the congregation. They had such a, a lively Sunday school class, and when we'd have somebody come that was new to our congregation, I was like, you might want to try that group. They're, they're really a neat group of people. But sometimes the new people would come back to me and they would say, you know, it's a little intimidating. They're, they're pretty tightly knit. And so I asked my neighbor about it. He said, oh, that's because we've been together so long. See, we started as a young adult class. And when he told me that, he was about my age. <laughs> and he said, let me tell you why we're so close. And he told me story after story after story. He said, when I had melanoma and I almost died, those are the people that saw me through. When my sister-in-law lost her child to sudden infant death syndrome and she asked why God, those were the people that picked her up and saw her through. He went after story after story and he finally said, you know, you couldn't break us up if you tried. You see, these are the folks we need in our lives. Because it's not easy following Jesus. There are times of trial, there are times we don't even know where to step next. And we need other Christians to hold our hand and walk together. Let us pray. Almighty God, I pray for each person here that they might be able to find that group, that strength, that support system that will allow us to continue in the faith and to grow closer to you as we grow closer to others. I pray your blessings upon our small group ministries at Braddock Street Church as we inquire about who you are and how we live. May you raise up spiritual giants among us through the whole process of lifelong learning. And as we gather for worship this morning, we pray for our loved ones and our neighbors and our church members. We pray for Nancy Levi, for George Quarles, for the family of Sheila Baker, for Harold Madigan, for George Morris, for Ed Orndorff, for the family of Mary Pixton, for the family of Sally Robinson, for the family of Ann Kellican, for Dick Harmison, for Wayne Dick and Denny Bromley, for Norris Wilson, 
for the family of Jimmy Carroll, for the family of Sonny Higgs, for Amanda and Sean Flaw, for Alyssa Gardner Farquhar, for Debbie Chapman, for Kathy Fumagatti, and for others whom we name in our hearts. We pray for our neighbors, for those who are homeless, for those who don't have jobs, for our nation's troops and their families, for victims of flood and for victims of fire. And we pray your blessings upon our church's ministries, Lord, that as we reach out to our community, people may see that Jesus Christ is alive and risen and continues to love even through people like us. These prayers we offer in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has also taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.